Listen. So all the action movies that didn't come out in 2020 are finally coming out now, which is only funny that they got delayed because most of them are going online anyways. These two are action thrillers involving kick-ass women that surprisingly share a lot more than I was expecting. In terms of the protege, I thought it was a decent rent it that scratched the surface of being great action, but kind of falls apart in the third act, while Joe went straight to streaming because they already knew. Let me explain. So the first one I want to cover is The Protégé, which comes from the writer of The Equalizer and director Martin Campbell, who did Casino Royale, Zorro, but uh, also did Green Lantern. Is there a cut of Green Lantern, the the uh, the, the Martin Campbell released the Green Lantern cut uh, floating around out there somewhere? No. Hal, Hal, is that what it is? Hal Jordan, yep. It's also led by Maggie Q, who I really do think is an action star that doesn't get enough of a spotlight. And even when she does, they're like always claiming it for her. One of the biggest newspapers in that region had shortened my name because they couldn't pronounce it. They just didn't have the, the G and the L and all that together, it was just, it was too much. So they had printed my last name just as a letter one time, and then because they were the biggest, everyone followed. Y'all don't deserve her. Now, full spoilers. The movie begins in 90s Vietnam, where we meet Moody, played by Sam Jackson, who's always sporting a big old mustache whenever they try to make him young, but that's where he finds a young Anna hiding after her family was gunned down, and they just immediately click. 30 years later, he's made her his protege, and we see them on a mission involving a Don's kid, showing us how these two are the world's number one assassins, because while the new iPhones come with three lenses, hers comes with a dagger. <laughs> Now, one of the things that I do want to make clear, because I know that it's become just like a, just a reoccurring thing, is that everything nowadays is being compared to John Wick whenever you're dealing with a movie, dealing with assassins. But one, I don't think that has to be a bad thing. The movie can still be good, even if it has those influences. Because two, it is kind of valid when all of the marketing companies, especially even for Jolt and Protégé, are relying on selling it by having a similar world, by having similar color palettes, how even similar stunt teams. But like I said, this one's decent. Like the Continental and its currency we see a similar setup here with all the outposts and what they call betra coin wick had a whole network on the streets to get you info here it's this biker gang that can get you anywhere and if anything it is relying more on the old cliches like getting a hacker to hack you into the next plot point as he sits on his hacker lair with no lie a poster that says hacker's life they also stunt the action in my opinion with multiple shots where you just know maggie would have ended up looking like swiss cheese after some of these scenes and even a moment where she escapes via fire hose that by the third level her arm would have popped off and she would have been left looking like Bucky. Exactly who are you people? We just... We just find people who can't be found. Personally, I did like the whole parent-kid relationship between these two. You know, they got the whole protege thing going down and they're running this fake plumbing company when in reality they're getting paid $7 million a job to take people out. This is R&D plumbing. Your leak has been fixed. And while it's not the most expansive thing for the characters, at least you can tell that they liked each other. You know, she gives him a guitar for his birthday that he's really been wanting and you get a little backstory there. He buys her the bookstore that she wants because that's the passion that she really has outside of, you know, killing people. But then they legit just come in and blow him away like Django. The bad guys end up coming in and even shooting up her bookstore and everything goes to hell as she decides to go hunt as the protege to get revenge on Sam's killers. I just wanted to end their life. standing in my way. One of them just so happens to be Keen's character of Rembrandt, who supposedly did his own stunts for this movie, so... I guess the MCU, DCU money's coming in nicely, but it's a nice little cat and mouse game between the two of them because they're always switching back and forth on who's chasing who, while they also technically kind of like each other, but he's also kind of like working for the bad guy, so no matter how friendly he gets, you know this man's still a vulture looking out for his own? I'd really like to see you again, under different circumstances. These are the best circumstances you'll ever see me in. What I wasn't expecting though, was how they treat their fighting like foreplay, cause don't lie, there is a moment where she has the one up on him, and this man really proposes a counter offer and says, do me or p me. Oh my. On a journey, they end up putting her through the ringer, and it's not one of those where she's the one who's kicking ass and doesn't get it back. No, like they have her punched, kicked, thrown, blown, and rocked. And it's only because Maggie's been killing it since Nikita that she was game for it all. Like, I, I don't know where it went from Anna getting tortured to Maggie, because they really were connecting with those kicks on set. Oh! Come on, it doesn't get much better than that. And mind you, she legit had full-on spinal surgery right before filming, so sheesh. Now, while the director and Maggie have both worked with Jackie Chan in the past, and they, they know action, what they really needed to work with was a better script, because by the third act, you know, everything was falling faster than the goons who Anna was knocking down. It turns out that Sam isn't even dead, so all that recreated footage that they showed us from the perspective of a skilled international assassin, it was just there to dupe us, which I'm never a fan of. It was Sam's plan to actually fake his death in order to get back at his old contract 
actor who's been orchestrating everything, but they legit use drone ex machina. Like there is this drone throughout the whole movie that appears, you know, it, it pops up to move the plot forward. It appears right at the, you know, the, the climax of a scene to save the day. Hell, this thing probably even shot some of the shots for the movie. So when it comes to the IMDb, this drone should have multiple credits. In the end, Sam does die again, but takes out the head honcho that we never really even got to know as Maggie ends up having more stamina than Keaton and takes him out living long enough to see another day. But I don't know about another sequel. I think it has the potential to build its own world and have its own little franchise, but it really did shoot itself in the foot by actually cutting things out of the movie in order to have them for the sequel, which to me is the biggest assassination of the film. So there will probably be no protege for the protege. Next up is Jolt, which is over on Amazon Prime, and it comes from director Tanya Wexler, who did Buffalo, which I really like, and I highly recommend that one. Uh, this one belongs on streaming. It follows Lindy, who was born with a neurological disorder. No, I've got um, an impulse control uh, problem. She's out there causing more damage in the school than their curriculum, gets bounced as a bouncer, and at one point even joins the military, but because her body's a weapon that causes too much mass destruction, they discharge her, which is... Something the United States would never do. Stanley Tucci plays her doctor who created this electro device that she puts on her body in order to calm her anger, but even though they got her clicking away more than Sandler with this remote, it doesn't really work. It really just ends up being like a reverse crank that's boosting her powers. And I'm not saying that this movie is good by any means necessary, but I will say that I was not expecting it to be as goofy as it was. Er, sorry. Goofy. Like at one point, her doctor Tucci really prescribed her to get it in the coochie to release her stress. Penis is not going to fix me, Dr. Freud. She's reluctant, however, because her sex dreams are so wild that Christian Grey would take his private jet the other way. But luckily, she ends up meeting Justin, who doesn't mind her being divergent, and they hit it off so well. Well, I don't see anything wrong with you. Oh my. Like, this man gave her the D once and then gifted her a D500. I guess. All she needed was some Obviously, the theme in the movie revolves around the idea of women having to suppress their emotions to be out in society. Like, there's obvious phallic imagery. She ends up, you know, getting shifted once with her gears, and now she's a pro at stick. But there's even a point where Dr. Tucci has a whole rundown, you know, a whole list of the scientific history dealing with women. Would you like me to put leeches on your skin? Would you like me to drill a hole in your head to release the demons? Would you like me to make you drink your own urine? But now... One, can you imagine your doctor repeating your traumatic treatments that he already knows about back to you? And two, it is funny that they have those themes in the story, uh, only for it to end up being the plot of a woman avenging a man that she knew for one day. They end up finding his body shot up in a dumpster as Lindy meets two of the most unhinged cops I've seen in a movie. Freeze! Freeze! Don't move. Don't breathe. Don't fucking fight. And that's where you realize that the movie really does have this sardonic take to it, because even with her anger that she's built up, right? She is written to be very dry and nonchalant. It is a woman who will go to an underground fight club like it's a Mariano's that she's shopping at. And it's in her search for Justin's killer that she goes nuts on this underworld mob boss in order to get some info. Of course, she meets a hacker at a Best Buy who gets her to the next scene. And legit, Tom Brady's a couple babies in order to get away. Get and look, in my opinion, I think that the fights could have had potential. I really did like this guy getting sandwiched in the face, but there are so many moments where you can see the shots be sped up, cut up, zoomed in. They even overdo this bit where she plays out the beating that she wants to do, but ends up not doing that over and over and over again. And eventually, you know, she does find the old head who she thinks is behind it all, only to see that it's Jai boomeranging himself back into the story. <laughs> So, yet again, another turn of seeing a person dead, but not really. Pretty much this dude who gave her the D in a box was never worried about her being wired up because it was his long con to turn her into a weapon and manifest her power so that he can take control. I'm gonna fucking kill you. You could try. Or we just fuck instead. Did these movies share notes? After avenging his death the whole movie, she decides it's a good day for him to die hard and just boom, takes him out. We then wrap it with Susan Sarandon who was narrating at the beginning and then pops up at the end like Nick Fury, who's supposed to be her doctor that set her up early on, but really is just here to set up a sequel in what feels less like a movie and more like the pilot to a series. But with streaming, what's the difference? Thank you all for watching this video. I'm curious to know your thoughts down below in the comment section. You know, Joe, 
didn't care for it too much, but it was interesting to note that the stuff on the Protégé when they were filming it, I know they were filming it internationally, like in Romania, and they actually like filmed right before COVID hit, like just like a couple days before. So it's going to be interesting with a lot of these action movies, um, you know, who got hit with the stints and you have a movie that you probably shot a little bit of or half of it of, and then everyone still needs to come back after a break, make sure that they're toned up, you know, get back to beating each other up, how that's going to affect a lot of these movies because whenever a movie does reshoots, many times you could tell, I can't imagine just stopping the entire production halfway through. So uh, we'll, we'll see how that goes. And like I said, with the Renaissance, that is the John Wick verse, everything's being compared to that. Um, you know, it's rightfully so because even with the upcoming Kate on Netflix and I'm excited for, that's also all coming from the same stunt team. So we'll see what happens with that and, and how things get expanded upon. But uh, I'm just for the idea that everyone needs to come together and the Oscars need to recognize stunts just in general because it's not just for the acting categories. There are really There's really stunt teams out there for everything, not just action movies. Like Little Women had stunt people as well. So uh, that's a category that I'm always pushing for in terms of the Oscars. But I'm curious to know your thoughts on any of these two movies, anything else that's coming up. And until next time, don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe. And I'll send you a Nikon.